Every year, millions of hunters rack up tons of credit card debt buying all the best gear. They get on a hunt, they work hard for days to find an animal, and then when the moment of truth comes, we botch the shot. It can happen to anybody, but it's because we put too, too much focus on the stuff and not enough on our ability to shoot well, especially in challenging conditions. So for this video, I got two of the best long range shooters that I know, and they dropped a ton of great golden nuggets in this. We're going through seven myths for long range shooting. Sit back and enjoy. The first one is, you need a new gun to shoot long range. Now don't tell your wife that I said this <laughs> because you you need a new gun, Mrs. Whoever was watching this video, um, but you really don't. So these two guns that we've been shooting this week and they're on stock factory actions, yep. just upgraded them over time. So if somebody had a Tika action or a Savage action, maybe even a barreled action, if it's already shooting well. Or a Remington. I think everyone yeah, in the sure. US has a Remington. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you really can just, outfit it then for yep. shooting long range with a bipod. Uh, awesome stock, which yep. we need to talk about. Barrel, w what kind of upgrades would you usually want to make? Uh, so I would say stock, first of all, um, because that transfers recoil into your, into your body and that, that has to be consistent, right? So your rifle has to fit you. Um, second thing I would do is um, a good scope, for sure, 100%, and then a good trigger. So it's a very different take on the rifle stock. I want to tell you a couple things that I noticed right away, and then you tell me the more advanced stuff. One, you have an adjustable butt pad so it can cant into your shoulder and rise up so when you're prone, you're not just touching an inch of it. It can fully engage in your shoulder. You got push button here to adjust your cheek riser. And then the bipod can mount on the top because you have a pick rail up Correct. here so that your recoil tracks more straight and you're not kind of balancing on a pivot Correct. point. Yes. But you have two different stocks. This is a more, uh, I guess maybe full feature, heavier. Yeah, this, this is the uh, GRS Vorg. Um, the one I'm holding here is the GRS Bifrost. This is more like hunter oriented. Um, so that's the kind of the, the take on the full or long range system. The thing I wanted to ask you about is this grip. Yep. So almost all the long range stocks have gone to a pistol grip here with a thumb shelf on the side. Yep. So you're not beer canning it, you're putting your thumb on the side. Correct. I, I, I can appreciate that because it helps you make a 90 degree tr trigger squeeze. But I like this one that you just put your hand in there. And it's like, oh, we're home, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very natural feel. <laughs> but it still allows you to get that 90 degree yes, trigger sir. squeeze. So one of the key things with us, uh, with our grips, they're actually canted six, six degrees off the core of the rifle. So you get that very natural uh, angle in your hand when you shoot. And component stocks, they're available everywhere. Yes, they are. The next myth is you need a Magnum cartridge to shoot super long range. So coming into this, we shot some very, very long shots. We're about to go shoot a mile yep. and we've shot almost to 1500 yards. And so when we saw the guns lined up, I thought, whoa, there's a 6.5 Creedmoor and a 300 PRC. I thought, man, at 1,500 yards, you want the big guns, right? Um, because it's going to deflect less in the wind. It's going to drop less. It's going to help kind of cover your errors in reading wind and things. But honestly, after shooting for a few days with, with multiple of these guns, even out to 1,500 yards, there's a distinct advantage to a lighter cartridge like the Creedmoor. Mm. As we discussed last night, when you shoot, when you hunt for something or hunt for deer or whatever it is, it's not about the the, the um, size of the cartridge. It's the shot placement, right? Absolutely. So, and uh, with the, the 6.5 Creed one, that really impressed me as well. You were shooting that yesterday out to 1467, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First round hit in um, pretty heavy winds. And then oh just, wow! Yeah, and that compared to a, a 300 PRC at that same long shot, like. It, you know, it, they were both capable of making a 1,500-yard yep. shot. Yep. Yeah, absolutely, especially from a long-range perspective with the advancement of technology, obviously the ballistic solutions in there. We can get a very accurate solution whether we're shooting a small cartridge or a larger cartridge. So that common misconception in there is, okay, the bigger the better. Well, that's not always the case. We want somebody that's going to be much more comfortable with the gun, mm -hmm. not be as fearful of the recoil so they can stay in the sight picture better, the better fundamentals, they can squeeze the trigger better, and they're not gonna worry worried about the recoil. So I would much rather have a smaller caliber than a larger caliber, especially for uh, an instructional standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing, that two other things that you helped me to focus on this week is one, so if I'm you know lined up on the steel and I shot to the right, oh, before this, the right. I kind of thought, oh, I'm to the right, I need to go a little to the left. And what you drilled into us is no, 
go in and measure how much to the right are you? You put that reticle back on the steel and you say, no, okay, I'm three tenths to the right. Oh, looking at your reticle right little the... subtensions on there, right? I say, I'm three tenths right instead of just a little bit, you know? Right. And if you do that, the second shot, you have a really high prob probability of hitting because the wind is probably the same after that first shot and you know exactly where your first one went. That's exactly right, yeah, and that's a common, it, it takes practice, you know, yep. it takes a lot of effort, but if you miss one way or the other and you don't know exactly how far you miss, you can obviously make the correction, right? But if we don't know exactly how far it is, and the wind might change from slightly from shot to shot. So we're just really looking to see exactly where we go, making the appropriate correction so that we have a, a higher percentage of hitting it on the next shot. You were also talking about the, the bold uh, correction. Correct. You want to dip into that? Yeah, absolutely. So most times, and you make a great point, you miss just off to the right. So if, let's say, for example, we've got wind predominantly coming from the left to the right, right? We shoot and we miss off right. 99.9% .9 of most newer shooters, let's call it, will make a correction, but they'll never make a bold enough correction. So they miss off right and say, oh man, I'm off to the right, I need to hold a little bit more wind. And so instead of, you know, most of the targets out there may be four to six tenths wide. Mm -hmm. So they missed off right by six tenths and they make a two tenth correction back mm -hmm. over to the left. The next myth is you have to hand load to shoot long range. All we shot this week was factory ammo and making shots out really, really far very consistently. So with factory ammo, it's absolutely more than capable of shooting long range. We do have a little bit greater extreme spreads and velocity differences in there. So that's one thing to keep in mind as we're truing our gun with factory ammo. All of a sudden, you know, we shoot high. Well, is that one that was just a touch faster in the velocity thing? Mm -hmm. So before we start making any corrections, let's let's validate that, maybe shoot two or three shots. Yeah, I've been doing some testing recently of factory ammo from various companies. And you know, if you, you go to the bottom end of the barrel, you get really wide variances of just very inexpensive yep. ammo. But when we're talking about premium, you know, good quality ammo from major companies, generally I'm seeing standard deviations between 12 and 20. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's good. You can do better with hand loading, for sure you can. Uh, to to decrease the variance in velocities, which makes a difference when we're making very long shots. We want that velocity to be very consistent. But it was good enough to make very, very long mm -hmm. shots. Yep. Absolutely. The next myth is you can buy long range. I think a lot of people are under the impression that if I do shell out the money for this big expensive rifle, now I can shoot long range. Mm -hmm. Again, don't tell the missus I said that. <laughs> but Man, if I were to shoot with a super fancy rifle and you were to take a Ruger American, I guarantee you'd spank me. I guarantee it. <laughs> so what are the things that do matter then? You need a rifle scope that tracks. That's one of the most important things. And that is what we've been shown this week as well. The element optics that we've been using, it tracks really well. Um, and, but it's all about putting together quality components as well. So, yeah. Sorry, I can't let you gloss over. So this is the Element Titan 3 to 18 by 50. This is the one I've been shooting. Correct. This is like $700? Yeah, it's uh, really affordable. And where I was able to make multiple first round impacts out past 1,000 yards, it cannot be off to, in order to do that. If yeah. there's a little error in that tracking of the scope, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, and so, I, without even a lab test, I can tell you, it, it is tracking right. 100%. If you have a rifle today that you're wanting to kind of build out over time, you got to have a good action that you're building around. Yes. And that's one where I mentioned the Ruger American. Now, I love Ruger Americans. I love cheap guns in general, and they shoot well for what they are. But the action is probably the weak part on a Ruger American. It's not a great action. doesn't feed real reliably and stuff. And so, if you do have one that you're wanting to build out, start with a great action. Mm. You know, a Tika action would be awesome to start with. Um, and then you can decide what pieces to build around it. The next myth is that modern ballistics apps really solve everything you need to know about long range shooting. So you type everything that you want into the app. We used Hornady's app this week. And you put in your velocity of your bullet, your twist rate of your rifle, all the details. And then it'll tell you exactly what you need to dial your turret to in order to make those long range shots. Now, I had always been under the assumption that at that point, if I miss at six or 800 yards, it's because I missed. What I learned is every gun is an individual. And even if they've shot all of those bullets on Doppler radar, there some, might be something about my barrel that engraves more in the bullet and it just causes more drag. And at 600 yards, I might just consistently hit low. 
So Josh showed us how to use the axial form factor that is just saying like, hey, if you're consistently low, you make that, that truing adjustment in the app to your gun, and then you'll find it becomes much more accurate. So the apps are incredible, but they still need to be trued. So if I were to type everything in and I'm low at 400 consistently, that's where I'd use that. Exactly, so yeah, so we have a good solid zero. That's the first thing we wanna check is we wanna check, make sure we've got a good solid zero. We know exactly what our velocities are. And then we're gonna go out and shoot at a distance, see how it lines up. So there's other things that go into the app itself that, that form factor. So if we're low, what it's doing is that projectile is creating more drag than what the app is calling for. So we're gonna go in and change that form factor so that we're gonna drew it for probably a tenth, maybe two tenths low at 400. We're gonna true that and change that axial form factor so that it comes up. Then we go and shoot it at a further distance to make sure it's lining up. So it doesn't do us any good if we hit a target dead center at 800 yards, but now we're high at 400 or low at 500 or whatever the case may be. So uh, the other thing that we showed at the class as well is the direction of the wind. So if we have a predominant left to right wind versus a right to left wind, that wind deflection is going to change our, our elevation come up and we're going to change our turret accordingly. So one of the things that we do on the app, make sure we have input data, make sure we have that wind deflection in there. So if we're trying to true our gun up and we have a predominant wind coming from one direction versus the other direction and we haven't calculated that or you know, changed that in the app itself, it's going to give us a false reading. So uh, one question, um, did you have a um, set length or a set um, distance to, that you use for truing that? Yeah, I prefer 800 yards. 800 yep. yards is a really good distance in yep. there. Uh, and it's wind dependent, right? If it's a really windy day, I might go closer to four or 500 mm. yards. Uh, but I always like if we set up a range, we have 400, 600, 800. Those are always really good distances. Yep. Can we can true it up at 800, make sure it lines up at 400, make sure it lines up at 600. You have to be an amazing shot to make long range shots. It seems to me that someone could learn the mechanics of shooting well, mm -hmm. you know, to sit down and if the gun were dialed, everything was perfect, somebody told them what the wind was and everything else was set up, you could take a brand new shooter and they, they could shoot a thousand yards right off the bat in a couple minutes, right? On the gun. That part is not that hard. And I think a lot of people go and shoot, but they're just like, well, I'm gonna keep practicing my trigger squeeze and maybe that's gonna be the key. So it feels like the progression is, first, it takes a long time to learn how to set up a gun properly, how to really scope a rifle right, how to get your dope and your ballistics all in properly so you know more than just a foot above the deer. Once we've progressed past that, then the game changes. And now it's all about learning to build a position in a tough hunting situation. You know, how are you going to get solid there when you got to get above brush or whatever and learning to read wind. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about fundamentals and doing the same thing over and over again. It's about consistency. Right. Um, what we used to do is teach something called brass. So it's basically breathe, aim, relax, slack, squeeze. Basically, you, you inhale, exhale a couple of times and then you have a natural uh, respiratory uh, pause is that the name for right. it in yeah, English? Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that's five to seven seconds, and that's what that's where you start squeezing the trigger. So you breathe, um, you aim, find your natural positions. Which is what we talked about, like not angling on the gun, but getting behind the gun behind to, the to, to to take that recoil. So by that you mean you know we're laying the gun out to shoot whatever prone, and you don't want your body canted off to Correct. the side. Yeah. You're straight behind it. Perfect example of that is the uh, 300 PRC that we had uh, this week. So those guns they have a violent uh, or violent. Yeah, they have recoil. <laughs> it is a violent <laughs> recoil. Yeah, <laughs> I might say so. Yeah. And if you're if you're angling that gun, you're kind of you're like a hinge. Right. So you get kicked off and you don't see your own impact or anything like that. But if, you, if you're straight behind it, it's perfect. Relax. So you go through muscle groups, make sure that you're kind of in the perfect position. And then slack if you have a two-stage trigger and then squeeze. So you, can, you do that over and over again. It's kind of the recipe of having a good shot. And it's all about fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And to your point, um, you know, as a new shooter, somebody that thinks, okay, hey, I'm not capable of shooting long range. Mm -hmm. So some of the instruction in the classes that we've done over the years, some of the best shooters are ones that have never even pulled the trigger yep. on a gun past yep. 100 yards yep. because they haven't um, learned those incorrect mm -hmm. fundamentals. So taking somebody that's never shot past 100 yards, getting a platform set up for them, getting a good ballistic solution, going over mm -hmm. the fundamentals, by the end of the day, they are the ones that are performing higher than yep. most of the people that yep. have shot for a long time.
until we break those habits, right? Yep. If I have a Kestrel, I don't have to learn how to read wind. So a Kestrel is, you know, a little handheld device that'll show you the exact wind speed and a lot of other things that it can do. It can measure your pressure, temperature, lots of other things. It's a really helpful tool, but I think some people have the impression that if I spend whatever 200 bucks on a Kestrel, I don't need to learn how to read wind. I can just go like this now. Yeah. Well, that, it is a great tool, um, but certainly not necessary, but you can get it in there. And one of the things that we would talk about as we did at this class is it's great to know what the wind's doing here mm -hmm. at the shooter's location, but I'm more concerned with what's the wind's doing down at the target mm -hmm. or halfway in between the target. That's something that I noticed quite a lot is you would kind of tell us what you were, you know, what, what went, when, when, you would tell us what wind reading you were noticing. And I'd be like, but man, I feel it on the right side and you're calling it left to right. I was focused a lot too, too much on what it feels like on my skin. And you're mostly focused on mirage and things you're seeing through your binoculars. Yeah, absolutely. At target location or on the way to the target location. Uh, this is a very tricky, you know, we're up here at the Hard Tice Ranch. It's a very tricky um, wind reading platform, mm -hmm. right? We have a bunch of canyons that are going through and, and canyons at different angles. So, uh, you know, like yesterday when we were shooting, we could see we had two targets in a very similar line with each other, only varying, varying in distance by 300 yards, but we had a left to right wind coming down the canyon at the first target and a right to left wind going up the canyon at the second target. So, uh, you know, kestrels are great to give you a good starting point. Uh, they're a great tool to kind of read what wind feels like, what the speed is. Yep. Is this a three mile an hour wind? Is this a five mile an hour wind? But to have one specifically for a long range shooting application, do you have to have one? Absolutely not. Could you maybe show us a few positions here that hunters should know because i think you know if if you can get prone golden yeah right but what if we've got to be at a kind of a kneeling height and a standing height could you kind of show us some of those key positions that a hunter should we're know? talking about yeah, build absolutely. positions we're going to try to get as low as possible that's going to be our stablest position that we can get so obviously knowing that unless we've got a really tall length bipod we're probably not going to be so uh, not going to be able to make that shot. So one of the most critical things to add to your hunting, to your pack in general, is a tripod, right? Yeah. So we could do it with shooting sticks as well, but for example purposes, I have a tripod here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the angle, and that's the way I'm going to set this up. I know it's slanting quite a bit, so before I even put my gun on there, I'm going to set the tripod up. Pretty good and solid right there, but now if I get in the shooting position like this, I still I know I've got to come up, right? I know I can't get at that angle, so now I'm just going to drop the legs out. I know this front one, I'm gonna go all the way out because that's got the most slant on it. Okay. Now, a lot of people will try to go up and shoot this off of a standing position, but again, we're trying to get as low as possible. So now so I've got to go So you're gonna go down solid. to your butt or stay I'm on go, knees? Yep, I'm gonna sit down right here like this. And then I'll always have, when I'm hunting, I have my pack. So I'll pull my pack in as I grab my rifle. Number one, I'm gonna be squared up behind the rifle. And the way I position the gun, I'm always going to start with the recoil pad in the center of my chest. That way I know I'm not coming into one side or leaning off to the other. So I'm going to get right in the middle. I'm going to take my pack. I'm going to suck my pack right here. Okay, so can I ask you a question about yeah. that? Is the pack going to stabilize your elbow or is it going to come It's going to stabilize the, the back of the butt. Yep, the butt of the gun. So if I can't get it all the way in there and there's too much of an angle change, then I'll put it underneath my leg and now it's going to stabilize my leg and then I could tuck my elbow into my leg. I wonder how many animals will be wounded this fall <laughs> that could have been saved if hunters knew this position well. Yep. Because that is, to me, this is like the most common shooting scenario I have when I'm hunting is you can't quite get prone because there's vegetation and, but you, you know, you don't have to go standing. You're just at that kind of mid height where it's, you know, most hunters are going to just kneel and kind of awkwardly, I don't know what to do here. So that's an, that's an awesome position to know. Yep, yeah, trying to get there, again, adding tripods, shooting sticks, anything, as long as you use your bag. We wanna to try to get a rear support. That's the biggest thing. Without, the rifle will generally have a front support, whether it's a tripod, bipod, rock, log, anything. As long as we can find a way to get a rear support, that's gonna help us make those and extend our range out. And I know a lot of people, every time I mention a tripod, say, oh, that's so impractical. Nobody's going to take that hunting. I will take that hunting. I know you will. I have hunted. I won't hunt without one. Yeah, I, it's, it's essential, I think. Because the other thing is, it's not just about shooting. You're glassing from it all the time. And if you can put your binoculars on a tripod, 
Ah, it's, you can see twice as much. Absolutely, yep, very important. And ranging yeah. as well, it's the same thing. So you need a steady position to get the correct range to the animal. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Well, thanks guys for being here and sharing some of your expertise. Uh, can people sign up for these classes that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So this one is a long range hunter style course at the Hartice Ranch here just outside of Stonewall, Colorado. Uh, you, they've got all the information directly on his website, harticeranch.com, I think. Mm -hmm. Awesome.